Alright guys, how's it going? I'm back again with yet more Zen 2 content. I'm not even going to apologise for it. Simple fact is, Zen 2 is the biggest tech talking point in well over a decade, if not ever. End of discussion. Right, so back in February I started leaking some major information on the Zen 2 microarchitecture, including its chiplet layout. Back then the info I had was 4 chiplets and 1 I.O. die. It wasn't actually until November that AMD confirmed it at their Next Horizon event, where we first saw a real shot of their epic Rome CPU. Now you just heard the names Zen 2, Epic and Rome. And no doubt many of you will be struggling to keep up with all the names that we'll hear in this video. So some explanation to begin with will hopefully help. If we go back to the original Zen microarchitecture launch in 2017, we see the four typical segments of server, desktop, high-end desktop and mobile or APU. Each of these segments also has their own branding. Epic for servers, Ryzen for the desktop, Threadripper for the high-end desktop, and Ryzen Mobile for the mobile or APUs. Ryzen and Ryzen Mobile also have R3, R5 and R7. Now, every CPU within these segments has a codename, the same codename. So all of the first generation Zen server chips are codenamed Naples, and all of the first generation Zen desktop chips are codenamed Summit Ridge, and so on. Examples of each would be the Epic 7601 and 7501, the R7 1800X and the R5 1600, the Threadripper 1950X and 1920X, and the R5 2400G and 2500U. Now note this though, the 2400G is actually a desktop part. It's got 4 cores and 8 threads with integrated Vega graphics, exactly the same as the mobile chips. The main difference is these desktop parts, the 2400G, the 2200G, they've got higher clock speeds and higher TDPs. You'll see why I highlighted the 2400G in this later. But moving on, a year basically to the Zen Plus microarchitecture. There are no Zen Plus server CPUs. The reason for that is the lengthy validation process of server chips. So AMD decided to skip that for servers and instead launched a fairly minor upgrade on Zen for the desktop, the high-end desktop, and very recently at this latest CES, Ryzen Mobile. Essentially, moving from Global Foundry's 14 nanometers to Global Foundry's 12 nanometers allowed AMD to increase clock speeds by just under 10%. And so we got the 2700X, the 2600, and Threadripper actually doubled the core count at a pretty high power cost. But under the mobile segment, you can see that I've used two mobile chips in my examples. The reason for that is there are currently no updated Zen Plus desktop APUs. There's still no replacement for the 2400G or the 2200G. That may come soon, or perhaps it won't come at all, based on this Zen Plus generation. So finally, moving on to the incoming generation Zen 2 microarchitecture and the stuff I mentioned at the beginning the Zen 2 microarchitecture, Epic branding, and the Rome codename. We're just going to ignore the rest of this until later. With Rome, we saw 9 chips in total on the package that Lisa held up. In a previous video, when I finally caught wind of there being 9 chips, I laid out the chiplets like this. But with hindsight, I guess the final layout is what made most sense, from the perspective of fitting it all on the package. To be fair, we didn't realise that IO die would be so huge, but at nearly 450 square millimetres, it certainly is one large chip. When I saw the 7 nanometer chiplets at around 72 square millimetres, I immediately declared that they'd be used in everything AMD launches in 2019 though. Servers, desktop, high-end desktop, mobile, and possibly even the game consoles. Now in December, I was leaked a ton of information on the next Ryzen lineup. I've gone over that plenty already, so for this video, I'll simply go over the table with the Zen 2 Ryzen information. The only stuff we know for sure right now is that the Ryzen branding will remain and the code name of the CPUs will be Matisse. So at CES, AMD demoed an 8 core version of the desktop Zen 2 architecture codenamed Matisse. That code name will be important soon. Lisa Su also held up a Matisse CPU, showing one desktop optimized IO die 
on the left and one 7 nanometer core chiplet. I do not believe this CPU will exist outside of engineering samples. The 8 core Ryzen chip that will exist is in my opinion likely to look more like this. One IO die and two 7 nanometer chiplets. So instead of using a single 8 core chiplet, it will use half the cores of two chiplets. We know the package has room for a second core chiplet and we've seen higher resolution shots with traces clearly laid out. I also have better shots showing the traces more clearly, but we'll get to that point later. After the event there was some bemusement at what AMD showed. I personally expected to see a 16 core demo, not an 8 core demo. But it wasn't long before guys like PC World and Ian Cutris over at Anantec got the real story. AMD had gone to their first ever CES keynote and sandbagged their real performance. That's worth thinking about because it's been a very long time since they've done that. Lisa was being coy with the exact number of cores we'd see with Ryzen, but it's pretty likely to be 16 cores, maximum. Now, a couple of days later, Ian again over at Anantec wrote an article with more information on Matisse. Remember, Matisse is the code name for the Ryzen desktop chips. AMD no chiplet APU variant on Matisse. One of the big questions coming out of AMD's CES announcements was that if its new CPU design, codenamed Matisse, and which enables two chiplets and an IO die through a single package, would support one of those chiplets being graphics based in order to make an APU. In our discussions with AMD, we received confirmation that this will not be the case. There is obviously space on that package for another CPU chiplet, and there has always been questions if the chiplet design is amenable to using a graphics chiplet instead. AMD stated that, at this time, there will be no version of the current Matisse chiplet layout where one of those chiplets will be graphics. We were told that there will be Zen 2 processors with integrated graphics, presumably coming out much later after the desktop processors, but built on a different design. Now, many people analyzed this as being really bad news for my leak, which if you recall, claimed there would be a Zen 2 chiplet and a Navi GPU chiplet package coming later in 2019. And to be honest, when I first read this, I was a bit concerned as well. However, Ian ends this part of the article by saying, this doesn't rule out a future processor using chiplet graphics. This is just for Matisse. And that was the key here. If we go back to our tables, we see that with Zen, the desktop part was codenamed Summit Ridge and the mobile part was codenamed Raven Ridge. With Zen Plus, that was now Pinnacle Ridge for the desktop and Picasso for these newly launched mobile parts. With Zen 2, the desktop parts are codenamed Matisse and the mobile parts will be codenamed Renoir. So when AMD says that, at this time, there will be no version of the current Matisse chiplet layout where one of those chiplets will be graphics. That's the reason why. If you remember, my leaked information had the 3500G, etc. Those chips aren't based on Matisse. They are based on Renoir, exactly the same as before with Raven Ridge's 2400G, 2200G. So what will Renoir look like? I'd say it will look an awful lot like my leak, with a CPU chiplet, a Navi chiplet, and an IO die. The IO die will be mobile optimized instead of desktop optimized, and it makes perfect sense. Do you need video outs like DisplayPort and HDMI on a desktop IO die that will include a graphics card? No, you don't. So you don't include that on the IO die. You do need that on a mobile IO die, however and with the desktop G-series APUs, because these aren't meant to have graphics cards. And on top of that, the mobile I.O. dies can be further optimized for bandwidth, as that is what the integrated GPU needs most. So, reuse the same Zen 2 core chiplet while having multiple I.O. dies depending on the segment, and because the I.O. dies are on 14 nanometers instead of 7 nanometers, they are much cheaper to design. The possibilities here with IO dies are almost endless. This is why I said previously that I was more interested in what the IO die contained rather than the actual CPU chiplets. 
Now, I said Lisa was being coy regarding how many cores exactly we'd see, but it seems for once that Mark Papermaster wasn't on the same page. As in this interview, over at the street, he gave away details which pretty strongly points to 16 cores when he said this. The same kind of performance gain that the servers would get out of the CPU, but optimized for the desktop. So it's going to be, it's very exciting because it really brings all that 7 nanometer, a doubling of CPU capability in the same power envelope uh, that we had in our previous generation. A doubling of CPU capability in the same power envelope that we had in our previous generation. Now, in fact, this doesn't mean for sure that we'll see 16 core CPUs at the Ryzen 3000 desktop launch. Let's take the 2700X as an example. It has 8 cores at 3.7 GHz base clock and 4.3 GHz boost clock and 105 watts TDP. In order to double the CPU capability at the same TDP, you would simply need to double the core count. So a possible 3800X could have 3.7 GHz base clock and 16 cores at the same 105 watts TDP. There will be IPC gains though, meaning that clock speeds won't even need to be as high in order to double performance. To be frank here, I doubt Mark is giving exact information when he says double. And if anything, we should expect more than double simply due to the gain in IPC. That also made me wonder if AMD could actually launch a 12 core part first while saving the 16 core parts for later. Let's use the 2700X I mentioned again. It would have a baseline score of 8 for 8 cores, 3.7 GHz being a base of 1 and the IPC of the 2700X also a base of 1. So 8 times 1 times 1 equals 8. If we then take, say, the 3700X in my leaked information, that would have 12 cores, with the base clock of 4.2 GHz being 13.5% higher. So at this point, we have 13.62, and we're trying to reach 16, remember, for a doubling of CPU capability. So we'd need around 17 or 18% increased IPC in order to achieve that doubling. That's pretty high for an IPC gain at least the kind of IPC gains we got used to before Ryzen. But it's certainly not unheard of, and we do expect to see improvements in latency, and also a doubling of L3 cache, which simply has to help IPC. So a 12-core Zen 2 chip could, in theory, launch at almost double the performance of the 2700X. I'm not saying that will happen, but the mere fact that it's under consideration is pretty mind-blowing by itself. It should also be said that currently, the maximum leaked number of cores we've seen so far is 12. That was with two different engineering samples discovered by Apisac, the latest of which was discovered only a few days ago. And only a day earlier, Steve at Gamers Nexus, he basically confirmed 12 cores and pretty much confirmed 16 cores as well, but possibly coming at a later date. And essentially, this will come down to timing. Six or seven weeks ago, I got information that AMD was thinking about how best they could keep the momentum going throughout the year. Launching 12 cores first at twice the performance, and then an even faster 16 core part later on in the year, is one potential way of keeping the momentum going. Though I still personally believe that they'll launch at least one 16 core part right at the start. Perhaps a lower clocked one though. But that actually leads me on nicely to the next part of this video, clock speeds. There are two important clock speeds on these chips, the base clock and the boost clock. The base clock we just talked about above, as base clocks are basically what defines TDP. That is not entirely true regarding AMD CPUs, however, I'm not going to go into that in detail here, so just assume it is for the purpose of this video. So as above, the 2700X would have a base clock of 3.7 GHz on all 8 cores and that should run around 105 watts when all 8 cores are loaded at that speed, loosely. The 3700X would have a base clock of 4.2 GHz on all 12 cores, and again, that should loosely run around about 105 watts. But what about the boost clock? There was a great deal of cynicism over my specified 5 GHz plus boost clocks, with multiple claims that TSMC's 7 nanometers simply wasn't capable of reaching 5 GHz. 
Now in previous videos, I had erroneously assumed that Apisac's leaked engineering samples were showing the base clock, when in fact they were showing the boost clock. So from what I can gather, the actual clock speeds of each Zen 2 engineering sample we currently know about are these. The first Rome engineering sample we saw was this one, with a base clock of 1.4 GHz and boost clock of 2 GHz. That was actually discovered by video cards. The first one discovered by Apisac was an 8 core Matisse engineering sample, which we now know had a 3.4 GHz base clock and 3.7 GHz boost clock. In a previous video where I broke down the code names, I said that we still didn't know what those four numbers coming after the first two digits stood for, but now, thanks to Marvin's codename decoder version 5, we think we do know. What's curious about this one is we now believe that the 1 in this 0108 stands for 1 core chiplet. That's according to the latest codename decoder. This only appears to apply to the desktop chips we know of and not to the server chips. And in fact, this whole section has been updated to reflect the likely meanings. The 08 stands for 8 cores. The curious thing is the fact that it's a single core chiplet with 8 cores just like the one Lisa Sue held up. Again, I believe this engineering sample layout will not be seen in an actual retail product. Moving on, the interesting discoveries are the two 12-core engineering samples. The first 12-core engineering sample has a base clock of 3.4 GHz and boost clock of 4 GHz, while the second 12-core sample has a base clock of 3.4 and boost of 3.7. And the final sample we have is a ROM qualification sample. That has a base of 1.4 GHz and boost of 2.2 GHz. So let's be clear, based on those samples at least, clock speeds are much lower than expected. That final ROM qualification sample, and qualification sample basically means that it's a chip that will go into full production. That one is particularly worrisome at such low clock speeds. It's worth looking closer at the Matisse samples though, as the first 12 core one starts with 1, which we believe means it's a very early sample. The second 12 core engineering sample only has a boost clock of 3.7 GHz, the same base of 3.4, even though it appears to be a later sample, given that the codename starts with 2 rather than 1. So why would a later engineering sample have a lower boost clock than an earlier one? Well, I think the main takeaway is, be careful with overanalyzing engineering samples, especially with clock speeds. The first Zen chips we saw back in late 2016 were 2.8 GHz base and 3.2 GHz boost, yet the 1800X launched at 3.6 GHz base and 4 GHz boost. So the final clocks were 28.5% higher on the base and 25% higher on the boost compared to the first engineering samples. If we apply that to the current engineering sample chips we know about, and please be aware that there is no guarantee that this is true, or even anywhere near true, then we'd have a 12 core with at least 4.3 GHz base clock and 5 GHz boost clock, which is remarkably close to the information that I got. That's a little bit tenuous though, I'm sure you'll agree. There is more though. First of all, TSMC themselves have in fact demonstrated over 5 GHz on 7 nanometers. In this paper from the ISSCC very early last year, titled A 5 GHz 7 nanometer L1 cache memory compiler for high speed computing and mobile applications. There is also a lengthy presentation going along with it. It's pretty complicated. But the paper starts by saying, in high performance computing, HPC applications, the speed of the level 1 cache will typically determine the maximum frequency, that is the Fmax, of the processor core. So basically what they're saying is, a CPU should run at the speed of the maximum capability of the L1. And in the presentation, they demonstrated an L1 cache macro capable of operating at greater than 5 GHz in a 7 nanometer FinFET technology they reached 5.36 GHz at only 1.12 volts, with the caveat that this was done at minus 40 degrees. Clearly, you need higher voltage to maintain stability at higher temperatures. We do know that on 12 nanometers, the Ryzen 2700X can be pushed to 6 GHz on all cores, 
under liquid nitrogen, but that is at an insane 1.85 volts and minus 196 degrees Celsius. This presentation though was held way back in February last year, like I said, and this is likely based on their 7 nanometers SOC process, which is basically their mobile process, rather than their 7 nanometers HPC, or high performance process, which is the process that AMD is using, which should allow for higher clock speeds. Again though, you might say, that's pretty weak supporting information, and you'd be right to say that. There's not a huge amount that can be taken away from this other than TSMC's 7 nanometers does appear to be capable of well over 5 gigahertz at low voltages under certain conditions. Perhaps most interesting was Der Bauer's recent comments when asked in a German question and answer session what he thought about the rumour regarding TR3, for example, 48 cores at 5 gigahertz. And though he was asked specifically about 48 cores at 5 gigahertz, clearly meaning Threadripper, he answered with, what I'd say first is, I think the 5 gigahertz boost story regarding the third generation is very, very realistic. I heard several rumours from the industry, which sounded really, really confident. 16 cores 5 gigahertz? Who'd have thought it? Der Bauer undoubtedly has numerous contacts at various parts of the industry. Motherboard guys, retail guys as well. And there's a fair chance that he has some within AMD too. However, perhaps he just heard about performance and assumed clock speeds? Clock speeds could still be lower and performance much higher, of course, depending on how much IPC, instructions per clock, has improved. So let's finish this part on performance with a look at IPC. IPC is a difficult one as IPC depends on what is actually being run. That is to say, it's not a set number for all applications. IPC gain could be near nothing in one application, or it could be as high as 29%, which we saw in a very specific workload chosen by AMD at Next Horizons. One major concern over Zen 2's IPC is, of course, latency. This was perhaps mostly due to the chiplet architecture, and we learned at Next Horizons that the chiplets would not connect directly to each other. All chiplet-to-chiplet -chiplet communication would go through the I.O. die. Clearly, latency would be adversely affected in those cases. And this could be particularly bad on the desktop regarding chiplet-to-chiplet -chiplet communication, as desktop loads, especially gaming, are highly sensitive to latency. I've recently, however, been made aware of multiple new sources, which when combined, appears to allay this fear. First of all was some new information which stated, the IO die allows uniform latency to every core on the chiplet, and the substrate has two connection methods, IO to chiplet, which is what we saw with Epic, but for Ryzen, also chiplet to chiplet. General latency will be higher, between 10 and 20 nanoseconds from the IO die to the core die, but it will be uniform across all the cores. Now, at first, I didn't like this chiplet to chiplet rumour, for the simple reason that we know that's not how it works on Epic. Mark Papermaster was explicit in saying that all the chiplets on Epic connect through the IO die. However, around the same time the information on chiplet to chiplet communication came to me, I also received some fantastic images of the Matisse package, including this one which really highlights the traces and a close-up. At first glance, it looks like the chiplets have 10 cores, not 8. We can see 5 things that look like cores down each side with all the cache in the middle. And for reference, here's what the current Zen and Zen Plus core complex looks like in comparison. Remember, this is 4 cores though up against what looks like 10 cores here. Of course, it's not actually 10 cores. And on closer inspection, we can see that these two middle cores are actually a little bit smaller than the real cores, the two above and the two below, on both sides. And if you scale the current Zen core complex onto each, you see what we're left with. It looks a little bit like a crossbar going horizontally and also vertically. So you have vertical infinity fabric links linking to the I.O. die here, and then horizontal infinity fabric links linking chiplet to chiplet. It's impossible to tell for sure right now, but it certainly makes sense from the perspective of the latest information I have of chiplet to chiplet communication and uniform latencies. 
By this point, you may be thinking of how we could see a real difference between desktop Ryzen 3000 and Ryzen Threadripper 3000 series. We now have a clear distinction between those. Threadripper will likely become a real workstation type CPU, with any pretense of it being a gaming CPU dropped. Simply put, Threadripper will maintain the same epic I.O. die, the same epic package, and my guess is core counts will rise to 48 cores. However, chiplet to chiplet communication, as with Epic, is unlikely to be supported with Threadripper. It could of course still be possible to maintain chiplet to chiplet communication with Threadripper too, but I feel that is unlikely. But moving on, and a different source also told me that Infinity Fabric will be decoupled from the memory clock. I now have two sources suggesting that, and it shouldn't be a huge surprise, as that was actually long speculated, even with Zen Plus. And the final point in IPC, I guess, would simply be that cash appears to be doubling, at least, and quadrupling in some cases. The second 12-core engineering sample discovered by Apisac also has the same W cache configuration, which suggests 64 megabytes of L3 cache, or 32 megabytes of L3 cache per 6-core chiplet. You remember the slide that said, Zen 2 improves on Zen in multiple dimensions? 64 megabyte of L3 cache on a desktop CPU is ludicrous, and I laughed when I saw a comment on Reddit saying, that was the same amount of memory on his first graphics card. I think mine was only half of that at 32 megabytes. You put all of this together and it simply means one thing. Latency will be down on average. By a lot, I would wager. And IPC will have increased. In some cases, dramatically. Papermaster, in the same street interview, said, AMD is mindful of the single-threaded performance gap that has remained for Ryzen and promised his company will deliver very exciting gains in this area while maintaining its multi-threaded performance lead. What you will see with our third generation Ryzen really is simply outstanding gaming performance, he declared. It should be noted that at the first generation Ryzen event, AMD demonstrated their chip versus Intel's 6900K running Battlefield 1 at 4K resolution, masking its 1080p performance. But at the recent CES demonstration, they demoed their 65 watt engineering sample running Forza Horizon 4 at 1080p. There are still questions over Ryzen 3000's gaming performance, but as far as I'm concerned, Intel will have no advantages left whatsoever, including low resolution gaming with the fastest available graphics card. But I'm done with this one for now, and I've been covering Zen 2 an awful lot, so I'll try to find something else to talk about next, but I'm not making any promises on that. I'll catch you later, guys.